I've, I've enjoyed sort of refreshing my mind on this subject and uh, have found so much good stuff to uh, share that I feel like I need either to postpone the worship service by a couple of hours or come back next week. But uh, we're going to move quickly through um, a lot of material. And, um, you know, I'll just try to sort of point you in the direction of some good resources and, and, and you know, you can study these, these things out more carefully on your own. But, so, the lesson opens, there's a quote here at the top uh, from a Spurgeon sermon that I want to uh, read to you first. Uh, it was preached in um, 1872. The title of it is The Paraclete. And so Spurgeon said, Dear brother, honor the Spirit of God as you would honor Jesus Christ if he were present. If Jesus Christ were living in your house, you would not ignore him. You would not go about your business as if he were not there. Do not ignore the presence of the Holy Spirit in your soul. I beseech you, do not live as if you had not heard whether there was any Holy Spirit. Pay your constant adorations to him. Reverence the august guest who has been pleased to make your body his sacred abode. Love him, obey him, worship him. Take care never to impute the vain imaginings of your mind to him. And so that last sentence there introduces a, a, a few thoughts that Spurgeon has about uh, the vain imaginings that we are, uh, we, I use loosely, inclined to uh, ascribe to the Spirit of God. And so part of this class is simply to uh, look at, you know, what, how does the Holy Spirit actually work? And uh, what is our view of spiritual gifts and how those are functioning today. It's interesting because this sort of dovetails a little bit with the book that we just started, uh, The Forgotten Trinity. And um, the point that Spurgeon is making in this part of his sermon is addressed in, uh, by James, by Dr. White, um, I can't remember, it's sort of late in the book. Um, Dr. White says, and I'll just read you part of what he wrote in that, at the beginning of that paragraph. I think it's chapter 9 or 10. He says, there is a reason why the Holy Spirit does not receive the same level and kind of attention that is focused on the Father and the Son. It is not his purpose to attract that kind of attention to himself. Just as the Son volunteered to take the role of suffering servant to redeem God's people, so too the Spirit has chosen to take the role of sanctifier and advocate for the people of God. But since it is the Spirit's role to direct the hearts of men to Christ and to conform them to his image, he does not seek to push himself into the forefront and to gain attention for himself. And so we see that the attention that is often uh, paid to the Holy Spirit in our world today is dominated for the most part um, by what charismatics promote. Um, ecstatic, suf uh, uh, ecstatic sufferings. Uh, ecstatic utterings. They are sufferings for those who have to listen to them. Um, ecstatic utterings that are unintelligible um, and, and that produce counterfeit powers of prophecy and healing and other supernatural ability, abilities um, to name it and claim it, as they say. I'm sorry, let me turn my phone volume off.
So we want to start with what, what, how does the Holy Spirit actually work? And this sermon of Spurgeon's, really that's the, the subject that he gets into. And so I wanted to start out by just summarizing briefly some of the points that, that Spurgeon made. And he, he points to passages in John 14, uh, John 15, and John 16. And I want to read those to you, speak to you a little bit about what those passages tell us about how the Holy Spirit works, um, and then look at uh, this issue of cessationism, what our church believes um, on that subject. So in John 14, start with verses 15 to 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then again in uh, chapter 14, verses 25 to 27, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And then in chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, but when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And then in John 16, verses 5 to 11, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And then continuing in verses 12 to 15, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And that the Father, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So, I want to just review some, some of the, you know, what we're to learn from, you know, these specific passages. And I'm going to quote from some of Sermon Spurgeon, which was as most of his are really good. Um, he says, first of all, in, in 14, 16, that the Holy Spirit is another helper. And so Spurgeon says, we learn here that the, the Holy Spirit, as the paraclete, is to be to us all what Jesus was to his disciples. Read the text. I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Plainly teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ is the first paraclete, and that the Holy Spirit is a second paraclete, occupying the same position as the living Jesus did. It would not be easy to describe all that Jesus was to his disciples when he lived among them. Now, all that Jesus was, the Spirit of God, is now to the church. He is another paraclete to remain with us forever. Spurgeon um, has a, a lengthy explanation of paraclete and the, and the different nuances to the 
meaning of that word, uh, but generally it's translated as comforter or helper. Um, and he says this, if there is any, if there is today any power in the church of God, it is because the Holy Spirit is in the midst of her. If she is able to work any spiritual miracles, it is through the might of his indwelling. If there is any light in her instruction, if there is any life in her ministry, if there is any glory given to God, if there is in any good if there is any good accomplished among the sons of men, it is entirely because the Holy Spirit is still with her. The entire weight of influence of the church as a whole and every Christian in particular comes from the abiding presence of the sacred paraclete. Treat the Holy Spirit with love and tender respect which are due to the Savior and the Spirit of God will deal with you as the Son of God did with his disciples. So, you know, I, I hope that the way that he, you know, explains that helps you to uh, think more clearly about what the Holy Spirit is doing among us and in this church um, and uh, of the necessity uh, of, of having a right understanding of those things and, 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 and of not dishonoring the Spirit of God in the ways that often happens in charismatic circles. So, so he is another helper. Um, in that second passage from uh, chapter 14 and verse 26, it says, uh, he will teach you all things. And so... The Spirit enables us to understand the things that Christ has taught us. What Christ has taught us is meaningless to us um, if the Spirit does not work in us to transform us by those things that, that we've been taught. Uh, and I'm, I'm not reading from Spurgeon's sermon now, I'm reading from my own notes. But people who read the Bible and do not obey the Bible have not been taught the Bible by the Spirit. Um, they may read it and have some sort of surface level understanding of it, um, but it is the Spirit of God who it makes these things effective in us, transforms us. Um, when you understand, when, when you have been taught by the Holy Spirit, you repent and believe and are rescued and delivered um, and you have peace in your soul. In chapter 15, in verses 26 and 27, we have this, he will bear witness about me and you also will bear witness. So we, we know from Acts 1.8, um, when the Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses. If the Spirit has not come upon you, um, I suppose you could fake it and, and you could uh, make an effort to be his witness. But if you are not his witness, the Spirit has not come upon you. Um, and so the Spirit of God produces in us um, a desire to glorify God. Um, Spurgeon said it this way, at this present time, our master and head is gone from us. How are we to answer the attacks of the world? Why, we have another paraclete to come to the forefront and speak for us. And if we only had confidence in him, beloved, he would have spoken for us much more loudly than sometimes he has done. 
But whenever we learn to leave the business in his hands, he will do two things for us. First, he will speak for us himself, and next, he will enable us also to bear witness. Now the Spirit of God, if we would only trust him and give up all this idolatry of human learning, cleverness, genius, eloquence, and rhetoric, and I do not know what else besides, would soon answer our adversaries. He would silence some of them by converting them, as he answered Saul of Tarsus by turning him from a persecutor to an apostle. He would silence others by confounding them, by making them see their own children and relatives brought to know the truth. If there were not a miraculous spiritual power in the church of God at this day, she is an imposter. At this moment, the only vindication of our existence in the presence and the work of the parak is the presence and the work of the paraclete among us. Is he still working and witnessing to Christ, for Christ? I fear he is not in some churches, but we see him here. And he goes on to recount in his years of ministry the, the conversions and the working of, of the Spirit of God in their congregation. And um, we are thanks to God, able to say that about our own church. In John 16, we have this, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And we know that that is a main work of the Spirit, opening the eyes of the sinner to his offenses against God, causing him to see his need for righteousness and causing him to fear judgment. And finally, we have he will guide you into all truth. And this is something more than causing you to understand the truth. It is the Spirit magnifying Christ in your hearts, helping you to appreciate and love all the beauty of Christ in his teaching, all the wisdom of God as revealed in the Bible. It's a spiritual discernment that enables you to recognize and refute error. So that is just a very quick summary of you know, what, what we see in John 14, 15, and 16 about how the Spirit of God works. And the fruits of the Spirit are what he produces in us. There are multiple, well, four main passages in the Bible about those fruits, what, what they look like. Uh, Romans 12, 6 to 8, it says, um, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Um, we're going to come back and, and we're going to dig deeper into these things, but um, this one in particular gets sort of twisted um, you know, it's, it depends on the sort of the, the lens through which you see these things. Um, uh, you know, what is the utterance of wisdom? What is the utterance of knowledge? Um, but going on in verse 9, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So the charismatics would, would, would take that and, and say that all of the, well, we're going to look at the continuum of, you know, continuationists versus cessationists, but the the sort of extreme continuationists would say all of those things are still at work in the church today. Um, and that is not what we believe. 
1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God has appointed in the church, first, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. And then Ephesians 4, 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So we're going to look at those and, and understand wh how they worked in the early church, wh why they are no longer necessary, many of, the, of these gifts that we're, we're talking about here, um, and how the theology that gives rise to what we see uh, in uh, sort of the extreme charismatic group where, you know, we have all modern day apostles who are all receiving revelation from God, where we have, uh, you know, prophets who uh, have special revelation all the time. Uh, all of that is rooted in a uh, theology that uh, almost always is a damning um, false gospel. But not all not all charismatics are unconverted, so I, I don't want to I don't want to say that you know that, I mean I know some who are continuationists who I believe are converted, some are poorly discipled, um, some are just stubborn, um, and some are people we respect. Uh, their, their you know their theology is reformed, uh, but they're they're open to, I, I think, error. So we have, we have this continuum of uh, uh, the, the was what our, when Pastor Marcos first wrote this lesson, he, 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 I asked him, I said, well, where, did, where did you find this continuum? And he said, well, I sort of came up with it myself. It was, it was pretty good. Uh, but it starts on one extreme with apostolic continuationists, and then to the other end is extreme cessationists. So I want to describe those to you and then tell you where we are and then look at why we are there. The um, apostolic continuationists are, are those I was describing a minute ago. They believe we still have true apostles today who are receiving and revealing um, new revelation from God who are able to perform signs and wonders. We have true prophets today who can foretell things to come. And um, I, I talked with Pastor Marcos uh, earlier this week about this lesson and he, as we were talking about this, he, he said, well, these are the worst kinds. <laughs> um, and it's true, uh, we see this madness and craziness that, that comes with people who you know claim that they um, you know are, are, are the, the, the direct recipients of revelation from God today which um, just leads to total chaos um, which was close to the name of a book John MacArthur wrote years ago called Charismatic Chaos and if you haven't read that you should the other one you might consider reading is this one, Strange Fire. Um, but so that's the, the apostolic continuationists. And then there's the, the continuationists or partial cessationists. And these believe we have no apostles today, but that there are prophets who can prophesy the future and that God continues to speak to them with new revelations through visions um, and there is a small minority within this group who have a biblical gospel but they're an anomaly and they're only fairly recent in this history of uh, charismatic um, chaos um, Wayne Grudem is one of them um, he wrote a systematic theology that I, I often use, and I remember when I first started reading it, um, Tom Matugi said to me, well, it's good except you've got to watch for that one section on spiritual gifts. Uh, um, 
And it's true. He, he, he takes the position, and, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, that um, we have, the modern day prophets are not held to the same standard as the biblical prophets that, uh, you know, they can prophesy and just because they don't get everything right doesn't mean that we should just say there are no prophets today. Um, and he goes through this sort of lengthy defense of that by, by looking at Agabus in Acts 21 and um, it turns out that he's not right. Um, there's the open but cautious group. Um, they say that you can't biblically rule out the possibility of these gifts being active even though they agree that much of what they see does not correspond with biblical practice. And um, D.A. Carson is one of the people who has that view. Um, then there are the cessationists, and this is where we are. We are cessationists, and we say God can do miracles as he chooses, but he's not operating through these giftings that were evident in the early church. We have no tongues, no prophets, no new revelation. We believe we have the completed, sufficient word of God. And I want to sort of take a little bit of a detour right here. And, you know, as I was reading uh, and studying this subject, um, I found this, which I thought was really helpful. Um, it's a position paper concerning the continuance of revelatory gifts in the present day reported by the um, Association of Re Reformed Baptist Churches of America and adopted by their General Assembly March 8, 2000. And it's, it, it, it takes you uh, sort of section by section through our confession and, and addresses the sections of our confession that speak to this issue of how the Spirit of God works and uh, answers any, uh, sort of answers questions about even words that the, the confession itself uses. And I want to just give you a, a couple of examples. Um, I guess I should tell you that before I go there that the, the, the last group in this continuum are the total cessationists who are cessationists in the sense that we are, but in addition to that, they say God is not performing any miracles at all. Miracles have ceased. And that really does put God in a box. So, um, wouldn't go there. But, so, some sections of the, of the, of the Baptist Confession that, that, and Walter Chantry is one of the people who, who was on this committee. That was one of the names I recognized. Uh, he wrote a book that we, I think, still have on our shelf, Call the Sabbath a Delight. Um, but, so, the very first chapter, the first um, sentence in our confession says... The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal Himself and to declare that His will, and to declare His will unto His church, committing the same wholly unto writing, which makes the Holy Scriptures to be most necessary these former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people now being ceased. So, our position is that there, is, there are no revelatory gifts operating. We have the closed canon. It's, it's, it's sufficient and complete and so if someone comes in here and says to you, I have a word from the Lord, um, you can say, no, you don't. Uh, yeah, right. You, you have the completed canon of Scripture. That is your word from the Lord. That is how the Spirit of God speaks to you. Um, 
there are, there are about 10 different um, sections in here. But here's another one, uh, uh, it's still in chapter one, section six. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. In chapter 1, section 9, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself, and therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched by other places that speak more clearly, not by somebody coming and telling you that they have a special revelation from God about that scripture. In chapter 1, section 10, the supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined and all decrees of counsels, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men and private spirits are to be examined and in whose sentences we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Scripture delivered by the Spirit into which Scripture so delivered, our faith is finally resolved. So there's, there's no more revelation. You know, and if you think about it, I mean, Christ is the maximum revelation of God. Um, and, you know, to, 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 to claim to add to that really is... Um, t t taking glory from God to yourself. Um, and that is really at the heart of what motivates most of these people who come up with all kinds of nonsense. We were talking yesterday w with an unconverted man who'd never even heard of charismatics. And, um, you know, there's a... Um, even in his sort of outsider perspective, uh, recognizes that these people are self-willed and sort of self-glorifying um, when they go to such great lengths to draw attention to themselves. I'm not taking questions. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Um. <clears throat> How do total sensationists view salvation? Total? Sensationists. Se like you said, they don't believe in any miraculous work from God. So like, how do they view salvation? I don't know. Uh, total cessationists, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, they, I guess they don't view salvation as being all that miraculous. Um, I'll see if I can find out and get back to you later. How's that? That's usually how I answer people at the door when they ask me a question I don't know the answer to. Um, um, so, I, I mean, I won't go through this whole thing, but it's interesting here, uh, it, this paper actually addresses the whole Agabus issue that Grudem and, um, and a lot of others have raised in trying to defend the existence of prophets today. So I recommend it to you. And, and you know, sort of the underlying point is that, that our confession speaks very directly to, to these issues. So we are cessationists. And um, if you have a biblical understanding of apostles and a biblical understanding of prophets and a biblical understanding of tongues, then you will be able to connect the dots very simply. I say that simply. I, I, I've been working on this for, you know, a long time this week, and, it's, it's, you know, I've had to... There, there are times when I wanted, you know, I wanted the Bible to just say, you know, uh, there are no more prophets. Um, and, and it really, it does, but you have to 
pay attention. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But so the argument essentially, it's, it's, it's parallel in a sense to um, the argument that uh, Sam Waldron includes in his book. Um, what is the name of his book? Does anybody remember it? He, he, do, do the miracle gifts continue today? There's, that's the subtitle. I can't remember the... Um, Oh, no, it says, to be continued. That's a question mark. And so Sam Waldron in this book has what he calls the cascading argument. And this, you know, this lesson sort of follows that outline. But the cascading argument is, there are no, first, there are no apostles of Christ on earth today. Second, because there are no apostles of Christ, there are no prophets. Third, because there are no prophets, there are no tongue speakers and four, in view of the first three, there are no miracle workers on earth today. So, um, you, you can, on, on Dr. White's Alpha and Omega website, you can see the whole outline of Waldron's argument. Um, or you could read his book. I haven't actually read his book, but... Um, what we'll cover here sort of parallels the argument of his book. So let's start with um, a biblical understanding of the apostles. I say start, I've been talking for 40 minutes already. Um, Ephesians 2, 19 to 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So here is where the Bible tells us that while there were prophets in the early church, of course we know there were prophets in the Old Testament, but in the early church, the, the foundation was built on the, on the apostles and prophets. It, is, it has been built. We have it. It's the, new, it's the New Testament. It's the canon of Scripture. And um, there is no need for apostles and prophets. The, even the analogy itself um, of being the household of God built on the foundation suggests as much. Um, Waldron makes an interesting point in his uh, cascading argument, and that is that this phrase, apostles and prophets, um, is, a, is the way in which the Bible summarizes the New Testament canon. Um, so we, we have the New Testament we have what we need we, we have what the apostles and prophets in the early church were delivering to the people then that's what we have now and so we don't need apostles and prophets um, And it, it, he, he points, when he's explaining that argument, he also, you know, he points to the use of uh, the prophetic word or the law and the prophets or Moses and the prophets as the way that the Old Testament is summarized. Um, and so the use in Ephesians 2.20 of apostles and prophets is a way of describing the New Testament canon. And so we believe the canon is closed. That we have all that we need. And so there's no need for apostles and prophets. Um, now apostles themselves, we know that the way that the Bible um, defines and describes apostles, there, there were distinguishing marks that they had. Um, 
if you look at 2 Corinthians 12, 11, and 11 through 13, well, Paul says in verse 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. So this is one mark of an apostle, uh, being able to perform these signs and wonders and mighty works. And those were the... Those signs and wonders were uh, affirming that their message was from God. Um, in First Timothy one one, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Apostles were directly appointed by Christ. It's another distinguishing mark of an apostle. And so, you know, you can't have a, you know, someone who claims to you that Christ appeared to me and appointed me an apostle is denying scripture. Um, probably doesn't know scripture. Um, And, you know, a third mark is they've, witnessed, they've been eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus. Um, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.1, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And another interesting point in this argument about apostles is in 1 Corinthians 15.3-8, um, where... Paul is um, giving us the gospel. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So the last of all the apostles was Paul. You know, I've read this I don't know how many times, and uh, that never really just you know, zinged me like it did this week. Um, Paul was the last of the apostles to see the risen Christ. And no one alive today, regardless of what they say, has seen the risen Christ. Um, we have really mainstream, I, I say mainstream, it's almost a derogatory term, um, pastors uh, who will, you know, allow people to preach in their churches who claim that all kinds of things. You know, I have been to heaven, you know, and David gave me a tour. And... Um, um, the guy who wrote 90, was it 90 minutes or 90 seconds in heaven? 90 minutes. Um, was it invited to speak at First Baptist Orlando to kick off a series, a preaching series on heaven? What a way to start. <laughs> um, so, there are no more apostles today. And if we have this biblical understanding of why there are no more apostles today, we, we, you know, we can grab onto that and hold it. Uh, you know, it's important that you be able to do that. I remember when I first came to this church and um, we started going out witnessing with some of the people here. Um, and I had been doing that for some time. Uh, but um, I'd never been challenged in quite the way that I 
was when I came here. Because uh, most of my earlier evangelism efforts have been with people who had visited our church, at the, which at the time was First Baptist. But here we were just going out everywhere. And I ran into, you know, I don't know who I was with, but we, we stood at the door and, and these people answered and they were charismatic. And yeah, 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 you know, I speak in tongues and, um, and, and on and on and went through all this thing about their um, gifts. And I, I really wasn't very prepared to argue the point, um, which is... Uh, why I then went back to my Bible and started reading carefully, you know, especially 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and listening to sermons on it and, and studying it out and being prepared, you know, for the next time. It is, uh, that's one reason why evangelism is a means of grace. It, you know, you, when you go back and you're, you're challenged on something, you, you need to defend what you believe, well, you go back and you read with a, a different frame of mind. And um, so you need, to be, you need to be prepared. When somebody says, I'm an apostle, you, you know, you need to be prepared to say, well, according to the Bible, you're not. Um, so then let's look at a, a, a biblical understanding of prophets. We have in, in Deuteronomy 13 and 18... Um, Two different passages about uh, prophets, and in thirteen, it's it's a a standard of orthodoxy that's established. Uh, Thirteen five. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams that uh, that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord our God. So if you're not teaching what conforms to the revelation that we have, you're a false prophet. And in Deuteronomy 18, 22, we have, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So these two standards have not been rescinded you know nowhere does it say uh, you know in the New Testament that we know God no longer is going to require you to be orthodox and right <laughs> uh, and, and how you can sort of tangle yourself up in knots to you know come to the conclusion that you could be unorthodox and wrong and still be a prophet of God is hard to imagine. Um, so we, I mean, there's not that much in, 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 in the New Testament that speaks directly to New Testament prophets. There's, there's some passages. It's not like, you know, the Old Testament where, where prophets are front and center. Um, the, the apostles performed a prophetic function. But apart from the apostles, there aren't that many we, we see specifically described as, as prophets. Uh, one of them, though, is Agabus. And Agabus appears in Acts 21, 7 to 11. And I, I, I don't have time to go through this whole uh, explanation with you, but um, Agabus uh, says in... 2111, uh, and, um, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of the, Gal uh, uh, of the Gentiles. If you, and MacArthur makes a, a goes through this. Um, this prophecy and, and how it unfolds in the chapters that follow, including in, in, in Acts 28, and, and explains how the prophecy, there's nothing in Scripture that in any way undermines or, or, or di, um, diminishes the, the, the truthfulness of that prophecy. 
Uh, in fact, everything that we have really shows that it was fulfilled, just as Agabus had said. And so we have here a New Testament prophet foretelling what's going to happen, and we see that it comes true. So a New Testament prophet functions in just the same way as an Old Testament prophet. That's the point. There's not a changed standard for New Testament prophets. Um, in Acts 15.32, we see, And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. So their prophetic ministry involved encouragement, explanation, um, In 1 Corinthians 14, 3, we have, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. So we, we, we have these references to prophets. There's nothing that we have in the New Testament that says that they would function any differently from the way the Old Testament prophets functioned. Um, and we have Ephesians 2, 20, which says, the apostles and New Testament prophets have laid the foundation. And so, if you understand the, their function, you understand that we don't need them anymore. We don't need prophets anymore. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, uh, and MacArthur quotes him, um, let me see if I can find that quote. Um, yeah, he says, Once the New Testament documents were written, the office of a prophet was no longer necessary. In the history of the church, trouble has arisen because people thought that they were prophets in the New Testament sense, that they had received special revelation of truth. The answer to that is that in view of the New Testament scriptures, there is no need of further truth. That is an as absolute proposition. We have all the truth in the New Testament. We have no need of any further revelations. All has been given. Everything that is necessary for us is available. Therefore, if a man claims to have received a revelation of some fresh truth, we should suspect him immediately. The last issue in this is tongues. And if you have a biblical understanding of tongues, you'll see, for example, 1 Corinthians 14, 20 to 22. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers." while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. And what Paul is quoting there is Isaiah um, 28, 11, I think it is, where the, the issue is that these uh, uh, tongues that are not understood are used by God as a signal of his judgment. Um, on the other hand, Acts 2, 5 to 13, we see tongues being used by God to spread the gospel. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? And he goes on to talk about all of these different people from different regions who are hearing 
the gospel preached in their language. Uh, that was a miraculous sign that God used. Um, just a second, maybe. Um, and so, you know, for someone to say, but this happened actually once in a church I was in, you know, Sunday morning worship and this lady stands up and starts, <laughs> and, um, the pastor rightly said, does anyone here understand what she's saying? And no one did, of course. And he said, well, please have her removed. <laughs> and a couple of the deacons went and took her out. Um, that's good. <laughs> uh, so to close this, I want to go back to uh, Spurgeon's sermon. Um, if I can find this on page 130. He ends up, he, he says in his sermon that we just start out, don't let these vain imaginings, you know, um, insult the Spirit of God. Um, he says, take care never to impute the vain imaginings of your fancy to him, the Holy Spirit. I have seen the Spirit of God shamefully dishonored by person. This is 1872, right? Uh, I have seen the Spirit of God shamefully dishonored by persons, I hope they were insane, who have said that they have had this and that revealed to them. There has not for some years passed over my head a single week in which I have not been pestered with the revelations of hypocrites or maniacs, semi-lunatics who are fond of coming with messages from the Lord to me, and it may spare them some trouble if I tell them once for all that I will have none of their stupid messages. Never dreams that events, never, never dream that events are revealed to you by heaven or that you may come to be like those idiots who dare to impute their blatant follies to the Holy Ghost. If you feel your tongue itch to talk nonsense, trace it to the devil, not to the Spirit of God. Whatever is to be revealed by the Spirit to any of us is in the Word of God already. He adds nothing to the Bible and never will. Let, the person, let persons who have revelations of this, that, and the other go to bed and wake up in their senses. I only wish they would follow the advice and no longer insult the Holy Ghost by laying their nonsense at His door. Um, so... Let's pray. And I'm lady, I'll answer your question after. Father in heaven, thank you for the um, clarity of your word and um, how we can just have uh, complete confidence that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. In Jesus' name, amen.